Luis Garavito. Luis Alfredo Garavito was born on January 25, 1957, in Quindío, Colombia, a place terribly hit by Colombia's internal war at that time. Many families suffered the horrors of torture and displacement by the guerrillas. Garavito's family was no exception. Luis grew up in a deplorable environment. His family suffered the devastation, pain, harassment, and displacement caused by the insurgent guerrilla groups, and he, in turn, suffered physical and emotional abuse from his father. His father, Manuel Garavito, was a man obsessed with alcohol and women. He used to beat his wife even when she was pregnant and tied up his children before punishing them with a leather strap. When Manuel came home drunk from alcohol, Luis often ran to eye from his father because he could get beaten up for no reason. The way to punish them crossed the limits of violence, which caused Garavito to develop a deep hatred for his father. At age 12, he had his first sexual experience with another boy of the same age. It is, perhaps, from this experience that he developed a further sexual inclination toward his sex. Although he later had relationships with older women, all of his sexual encounters that resulted in murder or rape were with male boys between the ages of 6 and 16. At that same age, Luis had his first experience of violence exerted by himself on another living being. He claimed to have cruelly killed two town birds. A violent impulse that also occurs quite frequently in psychopaths and serial killers. Animal cruelty at an early age is a strong indication that, in adult life, the individual will be prone to criminal and violent behavior. In his adolescence, at age 15, Luis claims to be sexually abused by a close friend of his family, a religious man, and a church priest in the town of Genova, Quindio. Apparently, the priest offered Garavito to see a heterosexual pornographic film. Refusing the offer because heterosexual relationships were not in his interest, he was brutally tortured and eventually raped. These violations became systematic and were accompanied by torture, bites, and burns. Although individuals like Garavito who have committed murder, rape, and torture are likely to claim to have been sexually abused at a young age, it is wise to proceed with caution when hearing his side of the story. Luis Garavito is a man who rushes to tell his violent anecdotes, perhaps wanting to show a victim facet. The ability of a psychopath to make other people empathize with his story is impressive, they can build trust and empathy by manipulating both events and the very psychology of the person listening to them. Let us remember the case of Ted Bundy. Being prosecuted in court for the murder charges attributed to him, he convinced a group of women to empathize with him and believe in his innocence through charisma, eloquence, and psychological manipulation. Eventually, Garavito's sexual interactions degraded to the point where he, the older brother of six other siblings, stripped them naked at night and sexually abused them. Although he does not claim to have raped them, he does claim to have touched them and felt curiosity and pleasure. In addition to his father's physical and emotional abuse and the sexual abuse by an older man close to the family, Luis claimed to have been socially castrated in his school days. He was an isolated child that the teachers considered volatile and highly likely to cause havoc and tantrums. Punishments in Colombia during the 1960s were generally physical, teachers had the authorization to hit children when they were not obedient or caused problems. Carafito, like any other kid, was also beaten by his teachers. His constant problems with teachers and other students led him to drop out of school in fifth grade when he was only 11. He was not a social boy, he had no friends with whom to develop the concept of friendship, and he could not generate solid social bonds. Nothing would separate him from the chaos of his relationship with his father and his constant sexual abuse. At age 16, in 1973, supposedly struggling with depression and suicidal thoughts running through his mind, Garavito begins his journey as a predator and pederast. Trying to take a child to a train station to abuse him, one of the security guards spotted and stopped him. Police officers took Garavito to the police station for questioning, however, he was released because he was convincing in telling his version of the events by denying his obscure desires. As common with most pederasts and psychopaths, downplaying the seriousness of the facts is a manipulative tactic they use to evade arrest. That was how Garavito was released, minimizing the facts and denying the possibility of raping a child. 
His father, Manuel, furious with Garavito for having been detained for the alleged sexual abuse of a child, decided to deny Luis the possibility of re-entering his house. At this point, Garavito, possessed by hatred toward his father, began his nomadic life, constantly traveling and changing towns. The constant change of town and known people perhaps forced him to perfect his way of behaving and his level of charisma. At 18 and following his father's footsteps by being an alcoholic, Garavito frequented bars at night and used to pay town boys for sexual favors. Although he tried to have sex with older women, Luis claimed to have had trouble getting an erection as he only found pleasure and desire in seducing boys and convincing them to have a sexual interaction with them. At the end of the 1970s, Garavito approached children in different parks in town, offering them money or temporary jobs to take them to a distant field. He usually threatened them with a machete or a knife and made them walk in circles to tire them out. Threatening them with death, once the children ran out of energy, Garavito drank a liquor bottle and raped them. His frequent desire to sexually abuse children led him to question and lead a double life. He worked in a bakery, attended church, prayed, and cried for forgiveness in front of a statue of Christ for his atrocities, however, he continued to seduce minors to satisfy his morbid desires. His problems with alcohol kept increasing, and he was fired multiple times from the jobs he got for arriving intoxicated or for being too aggressive. That duality in himself led to deep depression and supposedly suicidal thoughts. At that point in his life, Garavito decided to attend a psychiatric clinic to treat his depression. Being treated by specialists, Luis Garavito expressed a deep desire to take his own life, however, he never mentioned the aberrant behavior of the last few years. In the second half of the 1980s, Garavito not only raped his victims but also tortured them. He gradually began to cut them with razors and burn them with candles. Luis stated in different interviews that seeing the children suffer while he had sexual relations with them excited him deeply. He would bite them on their genitals, make small incisions with a blade, and burn them with flame and the wax from the candles. He no longer found satisfaction in penetration alone, he needed to find the pain in the boy's eyes to reach sexual climax. At the age of 27, confused by his remorse, Garavito decided to enter a psychiatric clinic for a month for the excuse of having severe depression and a desire to take his own life. Although he never told the doctors about the horrible torture he had committed, Luis seemed to be at a stage in his life where he understood the evil of his actions, however, the deep desire to commit those acts clouded him. In 1992 in Jamundi, Faye del Cauca, Colombia, Garavito was drinking a beer in the park when he saw a little boy playing in the area. Garavito was immediately drawn to him. He bought a knife, a rope, and a bottle of liquor. He approached the little one and convinced him to leave the park towards a pasture far from where they were. During the night, while torturing, cutting, and raping the minor, Garavito said he recalled all those times that he was physically and verbally abused by his father and sexually abused by other men. He said that at that moment, he was filled with so much hatred that he pierced a knife he had bought into the little boy's skin. Driven by accumulated hatred for his past, Luis brutally murdered a child for the first time by stabbing him to death. He continued refining his seduction techniques and how he executed the kills. Later, he would not only settle for stabbing his victims to see the pain on their faces but would begin to decapitate his victims and amputate their limbs or their very genitals. Occasionally, he cut off the boys' penises and deposited them in their mouths. A year later, in 1993, possessed by an uncontrollable desire to see the suffering of minors, he decided to make incisions on the ventral part of children while they were alive. He cut long enough to pull out the intestines but not severe enough for them to bleed. Seeing that the police found the remains of minors and the search for a suspect had already begun, Garavito momentarily changed his modus operandi. He did not kill the next eight victims but tortured them and finally cut off a thumb. He wanted the police to believe that the bodies found were explained by a possible satanic group that performed rituals in the area. His strategy did not work for him since the children he released could remember him and talk to the police, which was dangerous for him. In fact, on one occasion, when Garavito was discovered raping a minor, he ran away trying to escape and broke his right foot. 
That wound later was one of the key points for the Colombian police to determine the suspect's guilt. While committing torture and murder, Garavito said he found fascination with esotericism and satanic practices. On one occasion, he claimed to have used an Ouija board to communicate with evil entities from the spiritual dimension. Not surprisingly, Luis claimed to have established communication with a spiritual entity and apparently sold his soul to the devil. In his famous interview with Colombian journalist Guillermo Prieto, Garavito claimed to have been possessed by a demon. This allusion to spiritual entities is quite common in serial and mass murderers. Once captured and sentenced, several murderers claimed to have been possessed or heard voices that seduced them to commit aberrations. On numerous occasions, the killer is diagnosed with schizophrenia or mental instability that prevents him from being sentenced to jail time but is sent to psychiatric clinics. One of the most recognized cases is Vince Lee in Canada, who murdered a 22-year-old on an interprovincial bus, opened him using a sharp knife, and ingested his intestines. He didn't receive jail time, but the judge sent him to a psychiatric clinic to treat his apparent schizophrenic condition. Finsley assured that at the moment before the murder, demonic voices incited him to murder the young man. Luis Garavito, immersed in the world of Satanism and esotericism, came across books on the life of Hitler. In his most famous interview with Guillermo Prieto, Garavito expressed deep respect and identification with the German Chancellor because he also had homosexual experiences as a child. Garavito proudly said, I admired Hitler a lot, I wanted to be like him. By 1994, in Gemundi in Genova, the concern of parents and police officers about the appearance of different corpses and the evident absence of the murdered children became much stronger. The eventual discovery in 1998 of 13 corpses in Pereira and 13 corpses in Villa Marcella aroused the deep concern of the country, international amnesty, and the UN. The Colombian police and the technical investigation body allied with international criminal investigation groups to expedite the investigation. Initially, due to the extreme mutilation, macabre torture, and murder, the investigators believed that the miners were victims of satanic groups that carried out sadistic rituals. The terrifying evil found at the crime scenes suggested that it was more than one person committing the crimes with affiliation to Satanism. The absence of thumbs and the numerous stab wounds found did not seem to be evidence of a single subject murdering so many minors. However, the frequency of liquor bottles of the same brand suggested a connection between the bodies found. Likewise, the frequency of corpses found under the same pattern in different places in Colombia alerted the authorities to the possibility of the same author committing those crimes. Bodies found in Meta, Antioquia, Quindio, Cundinamarca, Caquita, Narino, Huila and Valle del Cauca aroused the interest of the technical investigation team in the search for a single individual. Aldemar Duran, an experienced detective in homicides and major crimes for the Colombian Attorney General's office, and Alvaro Vivas, director of the CTI at the time, turned to the FBI for psychological profiling, a technique that had been developing since the emergence of serial killers throughout the United States. The provided documents by the FBI helped criminal investigators to determine the similarities found in the crime scenes from different parts of Colombia. Due to the premeditation of the murders, Garavito was classified as an organized serial killer. He took his time to execute his morbid plans and was not compulsive. Furthermore, he was classified as a narcissist with an antisocial personality disorder. This categorization turned out to be accurate because later, the detectives would find bags filled with newspaper clippings at the home of one of Garavito's sisters. These clippings were from the headlines about missing, raped, and murdered children with different dates and places in Colombia. This behavior is evidenced in serial killers with delusions of superiority and grandiosity. They keep these memories to convince themselves that law enforcement officers cannot catch them and to relive their murders. Those clippings were trophies for Garavito. During the arduous investigative process, they found a subject with an arrest warrant for the rape and murder of a minor in 1995, Luis Alfredo Garavito Cubillos. Although there was no direct evidence of his guilt, he was placed on the prosecution's list of suspects. At that time, the number of suspects amounted to more than 1,000. In 1999, in Palmyra, Garavito, who had fallen asleep in a backcountry, 
was awakened by the dry smell of burning grass. Feeling the burning go through his left arm and part of his back, Luis got up quickly and realized that one of his cigarettes had started a fire in those bushes where he had raped and mutilated a miner the night before. He immediately escaped, leaving behind his glasses, shoes, and liquor bottles. Investigation of the fire led criminalists to find the body of the murdered miner and to establish that the subject who had escaped from the scene of the crime had been seriously burned since he had no time to collect his belongings. The subsequent analysis of the shoes found at the crime scene determined that the suspect's right foot was in poor condition. The right shoe was more worn at the rear than the left one, suggesting that the individual was dragging his right foot. This conclusion coincided with Garavito breaking his right foot, avoiding being caught years before. The size of the shoes, according to simple mathematical equations, allowed the researchers to establish the individual's height, the subject had to measure between 162 centimeters and 167 centimeters. Likewise, the analysis of the lenses allowed the experts to determine the suspect's age. The police were now looking for a man between 42 and 47 years old. When police put together the suspect's height, age, and geographical spaces where the bodies were found, the suspect list was reduced to 25. One of the children who had been a victim of Garavito, but who escaped unharmed because a man passing through the sector found Luis and threw stones at him upon seeing the horrific intentions, was able to remember the details of Garavito's face and identify him as his aggressor. The police arrested Garavito, but he identified himself as Bonifacio Lizcano. Police quickly realized that Bonifacio had severe burns on his left arm, limped on his right leg, and wore glasses. As is normal for serial killers, Garavito denied having participated in the murders and rapes of the children found. Homicide detective Aldemar Duran, who strongly felt that Garavito was the right suspect due to past reports about Garavito himself, sat down alone with him and discussed what happened. Minutes later, Luis kneeled on the ground and began to pray. He cried inconsolably and apologized for his deviant and irremediable acts. Yes, I killed them, and not only that, I killed others. After his confession of more than 140 raped, tortured, and murdered children, the police managed to obtain his notebooks where he kept accounts of his atrocities, including details of the children such as age and where the events took place. The killer's incredible photographic memory helped investigators find the remains of the other children. In interviews after his capture, he confessed to more than 200 murders, including places like Ecuador and Venezuela. It is believed that there is a connection with another 100 cases of missing and murdered children in the past century. Caravito is considered a chameleon man with the ability to adapt to different environments and social groups and go unnoticed. He can pull off different personalities to mold himself into society and accomplish his macabre plans in the light of day. He convinced different people of being a beggar, a priest, and even a witch in some towns. He is cunning, intelligent, manipulative, psychopathic, self-centered, and narcissistic. He evidently lacks remorse and fails to understand human emotions. Finding pleasure in torturing kids is perhaps a sign of the development of gradual violent behavior. First, he touched his siblings, then he proceeded to rape kids and finally torture and kill them. Although he states that he is sorry for his past behavior, it is advised to not believe what a subject who lacks remorse might say. The need to keep memories of the places where he murdered children indicates sadism and grandiosity. These memories suggest that the perpetrator returns to the crime scene, even in his imagination, to relive the events and improve his execution techniques. Caravito is a sexual sadist who finds no pleasure in the sexual act itself. He needs piercing, mutilation, cuts, and pain to feel true pleasure. His ability to communicate eloquently and generate empathy is impressive. He manages to communicate with the interviewers cordially and, on numerous occasions, makes them believe versions of the story that are surely false. The same security guards of the prison where Luis is, assure that Garavito manipulates the interviewers so that they return to him, asking for interviews and thus feel desired by others. His modus operandi is based on strategy and planning. He deployed plans of attack to achieve results suggesting that he perfected his techniques of both persuasion and assassination. Garavito is a calculating psychopath, 
he waits for the right moment to put his plans into execution and achieve the sadism that gave him pleasure. He is considered a writer. He keeps diaries and notebooks about his thoughts and emotions. The sympathy Garavito has for characters such as Borges, Hitler, Gandhi, and Pinochet is evident in his annotations. A curious combination of characters suggests a duality in his personality. On the one hand, he wants to gain the respect that dictators like Hitler or Pinochet had back then because of terror and sadism. On the other hand, he wants to follow in the benevolent footsteps of people like Gandhi and Mother Teresa of Calcutta. In recent years, Luis Garavito claims to be a new person, wanting to continue with their religious life and looking for the opportunity to reach the Colombian Congress and help abuse children. He says that perhaps to generate sympathy from the public. However, the number of people who wish for his death once he is released is overwhelming. It is possible that his sentence, which was initially over 1,500 years but was reduced to 24, locked up in a maximum security prison in Valajapar. Daniel Blank killed six people before being arrested. His victims were around the perimeter of the Parish River. The murders took place over a period of two years before Blank was arrested by the police thanks, on the one hand, to a profile established by the FBI, and on the other hand thanks to a composite portrait. The motive for these murders was money, but perhaps they also had an emotional connotation, since he knew all his victims. These were all white and rather old. We don't know much about Daniel Blank's childhood except that he is one of eight children in a family of brothers and sisters. Her father was a worker in a sugar refinery and her mother's name was Alice. At the age of eight, he dropped out of school and four years later, at age 12, he was hit by a car while riding his bicycle. The doctors then diagnosed him with a slight cerebral dysfunction and a learning disability that hampered his verbal abilities as well as the conception of abstract concepts. His first job as a salesman was with a certain Ralph St. Pierre, before working for the garage Shea Doug as a mechanic, Victor Rossi. On October 17, 1996, Daniel Joseph Blank committed his first crime by killing 41-year-old Victor Rossi. He beat him to death in his house, located in St. Amand, Louisiana. It is his daughter who will discover him, lying on his bed. She will first think that her father is sleeping before noticing the many traces of blood strewn on the bedspread and his clothes. Daniel Plank killed him with a baseball bat found in the house. Plank had worked for him as a mechanic in his auto repair shop. On March 19th at 7.45 a.m., the St. James Parish Police in the person of Sheriff Martin called police officer Sid Berthelot. He asks her to join him at Barbara Bourgeois, 58, a teacher who likes to help children in need. There, they notice that all the windows and doors are locked and to get inside the house, the two officers are forced to force their way through. They turn on the light in the kitchen and then in the living room and then notice the victim's back. Barbara is lying on the ground and appears to have been stabbed several times. The knife will also be found a few moments later in the kitchen sink. Near the body is a vacuum cleaner on which the two police officers spot blood. It too was used to kill Barbara. We learn later that she lived less than a quarter of a mile from Blank. On April 9, 1997, Daniel Blank murdered 71-year-old Lillian Philippe at her home in Gonzales, Louisiana. Like Barbara, he stabbed Lillian several times. It was the next day that his body was discovered. Lillian had to pick up her sister-in-law, Viola Bro Philippe, to attend a religious retreat together. The latter, worried about not having any news, called another member of the family, Dr. Doyle Philippe, who then moved. Lillian's vehicle is standing in the driveway, the door to the house is unlocked, and the alarm system is off. Doyle Philippe discovers the body of the old woman around 8.30 a.m., resting near her bed, her head bleeding, a knife near her and a bloody trophy as a weapon. Later, we learn that Lillian's husband had bought parts at the store where Daniel Blank worked. From then on, the murders accelerated. Blank will kill three more people in May. On the 9th, he beat Sam and Luella Arcuri, aged 76 and 69 respectively, to death in their home in Laplace, Louisiana, with a baseball bat there, which shattered Sam's glasses. 
a knife was also found at the scene. On the 14th, he murdered Joan Brock, 55, in the courtyard of her home, also located in Laplace. Daniel Plank had worked in Joan's husband's auto repair shop. Violence is omnipresent there. Indeed, Plank almost decapitated his victim as the blows were violent. The police noticed on the spot that the telephone line had been severed as at the other murder sites. The county police are on edge. She understands that she is dealing with a serial killer and has no DNA trace or fingerprints that could allow her to find the murderer in her databases. On July 7, 1997, Plank attempted to murder Leonce and Joyce Millett, both 66, inside their house. The couple who slept during the attack will survive by a miracle. Plank forces them to get up and give him the money they have before punching Leonce in the face. He then walks into the living room, picks up his baseball bat, and punches the couple. What he doesn't know when he leaves is that both spouses are still alive. Urgently transported to the hospital, they will help the police to establish a composite portrait. The police, assisted by the FBI, then establishes the profile of the killer. It is about someone operating in his comfort zone which is that located around the parish river. The man is obsessed with easy money, even playing in casinos. Gradually, their search leads them to Daniel Blank. His bank statements reveal many movements of money and he is known to the local casinos. Plus, he owns the first victim's pickup truck. The police inspector joins him on the phone in Texas where he is and asks him briefly about his relationship with Victor Rossi. He also talks to him about his comings and goings at the casino, his winnings. Learning that Blank is to return to Louisiana shortly, the inspector gives him his phone number and asks him to call him back. Daniel Planks agrees. During this time, the police try to connect him to the other victims and make the connection with the husband of Joan Brock for whom Blank worked for a time. They also noticed that he lived not far from Barbara Bourjoy and that he had bought a car from Lillian Philippe's husband. The police, strong of these overlaps, decide to go to Texas to arrest him before he can flee. On November 14th, Sheriff Jeff Wiley and the FBI arrested him in Onalsica. Plank is paying for two coffees with a $100 bill when they land on him. They immediately take him to the police station for questioning. Plank reveals that he was in Texas buying an auto repair shop for $65,000 cash. He had previously acquired a mobile home for $20,000 in cash, then a swimming pool for $4,000 a dining room for $900 and a Ford Escort for $7,000. Barely in the interrogation room, the police establish a certain proximity to relax him and question him about his relations with the victims, his alibis. They also seek to know a little more about him, his family and where his money comes from. To which Plank replies that he sometimes wins up to $3,000 at the weekend at the casino. The police know he is lying. His bank statements show a net loss of $50,000. The police officers therefore quickly put him in front of a fait accompli. They offer him to pass the lie detector. Plank agrees. After he has passed the test, the inspectors make him talk again about his mother, who died at Christmas two years earlier. Two years earlier, that is to say the beginning of the murders. Finally, after several hours of interrogation, Daniel Blank confesses to having killed to satisfy his love of the game. A few days later, his girlfriend, Cynthia Bellard is also arrested and agrees to testify against him in exchange for the abandonment of the charges of complicity against him. On May 15, 1998, Daniel Blank was convicted of first-degree murder for the murder of Joan Brock. In December, during a break in his hearing, he managed to escape by jumping out of the court's second-floor window. He is caught after a short chase. On the 30th, his lawyers denounced the police custody of their client and attempted to demonstrate that the police extracted confessions from their client by force and by manipulation. Because of the excessive public emotion aroused, they also asked that the jurisdiction be externalized. Daniel Plank claims to have been illegally arrested without probable cause. He was interrogated for 12 hours straight without eating, drinking, sleeping, smoking. He thought he would be free to leave if he confessed. His confession was coerced and the polygraph test was tampered with. 
he was was psychologically manipulated into confessing. His mental capacity was such that he could not consciously cope with the waiver of his rights. His emotional state deprived him of his ability to adequately give a voluntary confession. His confession is constitutionally invalid because he did not receive the warnings, known as Miranda warnings, right to remain silent and the right to have a lawyer. These arguments will be rejected by the Supreme Court of New Orleans. In September 1999, Daniel Blank was found guilty of having killed Lillian Philippe. He is sentenced to death by injection. The following year, he was condemned for the assassination of Joan Brock. He pleaded guilty in 2001 to two counts of first-degree murder for the murders of Sam and Luella Arcuri. Again, he was sentenced to life without possible remission. After the trial, Daniel Blank spent 16 years of his life on death row at the Angola Penitentiary, state of Louisiana, before his execution was scheduled for Monday, March 14, 2016. This was suspended by the Supreme Court, which issued a reprieve on February 17, 2016. At issue was a drug issue that executed Daniel Blank. According to FBI behavioral agents, Daniel Blank killed in an attempt to achieve the American dream to be rich. He killed people for their money. Money that he gambled on, particularly slot machines and poker. The amount of his thefts is estimated at $200,000 much of which was wasted in three casinos. All of the victims were mostly elderly, making them easier to maintain and kill. Daniel Blank killed in a perimeter close to his family home, a quarter of a mile, and knew his victims. The police found in his house, several caravans, and a red Suzuki motorcycle on which he liked to parade. Psychiatric experts diagnosed him with paranoid schizoaffective disorder, simultaneous presence of depressive episodes and mania coupled with schizophrenia. They will learn that Daniel was very close to his mother, that her death made her suffer enormously and that after that, her feelings changed. John Edward Robinson was born December 27, 1943, in Cicero, Illinois. John was one of five children born to an alcoholic father and authoritarian mother. As a child, John became an Eagle Scout. He traveled to London and performed for Queen Elizabeth II. He even met Judy Garland, memorializing the moment with a photo of her kissing his young cheek. At one point, John was enrolled in a preparatory school for aspiring priests. John Robinson's life wasn't as squeaky clean as it appeared from the outside, however. He was kicked out of the prep school due to disciplinary infractions. John worked as an x-ray technician as an adult and was married to a woman named Nancy. The couple had four children by 1971, but that didn't stop John from having numerous affairs. John was charismatic, however, and continued to find work. In 1969, he was working for Dr. Wallace Graham in Kansas City. He lost that job, however, when he embezzled $33,000 from the medical practice. Somehow, John faced only three years of probation for this crime. John was later found to be embezzling from another employer, so his probation was extended. In 1975, the con man was again arrested. This time he was charged with securities fraud and mail fraud after forming a phony medical consulting company. Once again, his probation was simply extended. After his probation was completed, Robinson was again arrested for embezzlement and check forgery. Finally, he had to serve time. He was sentenced to 60 days in jail. Throughout the 70s, John served as a scoutmaster, baseball coach, and Sunday school teacher. He was named Man of the Year by a local charitable organization, although it was later determined he had forged his nomination and recommendation letters. After being released from jail in 1982, John formed a fraudulent hydroponics business and stole $25,000 from a friend under the guise of an investment in the business. The victim of this scheme was promised a quick return on the investment in order to pay for his dying wife's health care costs. He never received anything in return. John was a terrible person, clearly, but the depth of his depravity had not yet been realized. 
In 1984, John established two more fraudulent companies. He hired 19-year-old Paula Godfrey to work for these companies. Paula told her friends and family that John was sending her for training. They never heard from her again. Paula Godfrey was born June 19, 1965. She was an accomplished figure skater. She had a petite frame with brown hair and brown eyes. She accepted the position with John Robinson, eager to start what she believed would be a promising career. After not hearing from Paula, her family filed a missing person report. John Robinson was questioned but denied knowing Paula's whereabouts. Several days later, her parents received a typed letter that stated she was safe but did not want any contact with her family. The investigation was concluded at this point, with authorities believing that Paula left on her own free will. In 1985, John, using the last name Osborne, met Lisa Stasi and her four-month-old daughter, Tiffany. Lisa Stasi was born April 11, 1965, in Huntsville, Alabama. When she was 18, she became pregnant. She married the father of her baby and the couple relocated to the Kansas City area after the birth of Tiffany in 1985. When Lisa's marriage began to fail, she sought the assistance of a local man running an outreach program. That man was John Robinson, who promised her an apartment, job, and daycare for her child in Chicago. Upon meeting John, Lisa called her mother in tears. She stated that she was being asked to sign something and she was afraid the man would take her baby away. She signed several pages of blank stationery under pressure from John. She was never seen again after that. Typed letters were sent to Lisa's family, but they doubted the authenticity because Lisa did not know how to type. The family began a long and painful search for Lisa and Tiffany. Shortly after the disappearance of Lisa and Tiffany Stasi, John approached his brother and sister-in-law, who were having fertility problems. He explained to the couple that he knew a woman who had committed suicide and left behind a young baby girl. He arranged an adoption for $5,500 in what he called legal fees. He then delivered a young baby girl to his brother and sister-in-law, which they named Heather. Catherine Clampett was born May 29, 1960, in Korea. She was adopted by American parents and grew up in Texas. In 1987, Catherine left her child with family to pursue a job opportunity in Kansas City. She was hired by John Robinson with the promise of a lucrative job that included extensive travel and a new wardrobe. She was never seen again. In 1987, John finally went to prison. He was convicted on multiple fraud charges and parole violations. He was sent to Western Missouri Correctional Facility to serve his sentence from 1987 to 1991. During his time in prison, John met 49-year-old Beverly Bonner, who worked as the prison librarian. When John was released, Beverly quit her job and left her husband. She followed John to Kansas City to work for him. Her family never heard from her again, but her alimony checks continued to be cashed for several years. By the early 1990s, four women and a baby were missing and linked to John Edwards Robinson. However, no evidence proved any wrongdoing. John explained the disappearances away as traveling or the women's choices to leave behind family. Then John discovered the internet. Using the chat room named Slave Master, John was a frequent correspondent in online chat rooms geared towards BDSM lifestyle. He sought women who enjoyed being a submissive partner. That is where he met Sheila Faith. Sheila was born February 12, 1949, in Texas. She was the mother of a teenage daughter named Debbie. Debbie was born November 17, 1978, and suffered from spina bifida. As a result of her medical condition, Debbie was wheelchair-bound. When she met John Robinson online, Sheila was living in California with Debbie. John promised her a job and agreed to cover Debbie's medical expenses if Sheila relocated to Kansas City. Upon their arrival in Kansas City, Sheila and Debbie disappeared. However, Sheila's pension checks continued to be cashed for several years after her disappearance. In 1999, John met Isabella Luca in a BDSM chat room. Isabella was born April 11, 1978, in Poland. 
her family immigrated to the United States and settled in Indiana. In 1999, Isabella was a sophomore at Purdue University. She began a bondage relationship with John Robinson, relocating to Kansas City. John bought her an engagement ring, although he was still married to Nancy. The two even filed for a marriage license but were never legally married. Isabella then signed a lengthy contract with Robinson, agreeing to be his slave in every way. She granted John control over everything, including her bank accounts. Then she disappeared. John told friends in the Kansas area that Isabella was deported after getting caught with. Also in 1999, licensed practical nurse Suzette Trouton moved from Michigan to Kansas City to live with John. She met his online and agreed to be his submissive slave and travel the world with him. Suzette was never seen by her family again. Suzette's mother received several typed letters from Suzette in which she described her travels with John. The letters, however, were all postmarked from Kansas City. Her mother was suspicious as Suzette often made grammar mistakes, which were not found in the letters. Eventually, John told Suzette's family that she ran off with another man after stealing money from him. At this point, investigators were connecting the dots between numerous missing persons reports and John Edward Robinson. They needed more than suspicions, however, to make an arrest. In June of 2000, a woman filed charges against John for battery and another woman accused him of stealing her sex toys. With these complaints, John was arrested for theft and assault. This arrest opened the window for investigators by providing a search warrant of Robinson's farm in La Cigna, Kansas and his storage units across the river in Missouri. While searching Robinson's farm, police discovered two decaying bodies in 85-pound chemical drums. The bodies were identified through DNA as Suzette Troughton and as Savella Luica. In the storage unit in Missouri, detectives found three more drums containing three more bodies. The bodies were identified as Beverly Bonner, Sheila Faith, and Debbie Faith. Autopsies on the five women determined the cause of death to be identical, blunt force trauma to the head. Robinson was charged for the murders of Troughton and Luica in Kansas, and the other three murder in Missouri. Upon his arrest, authorities announced that they had found Tiffany Stasi alive and living with an adoptive family in the Midwest. They did not disclose her identity at that time, but it was later made public that Tiffany Stasi was Heather Robinson, John's niece. John had arranged the adoption of Heather by his brother and sister-in-law in 1985. DNA confirmed her identity. Authorities said it's our belief that this adoptive family had no knowledge of any criminal activity relating to the adoption of baby Tiffany. They believed they were the adoptive parents of this little girl, but it was not a legal adoption. His brother was just another victim of all this, Strangeland, Paparella, and Francis, 2019. In later interviews, Heather spoke of the man she believed to be her uncle John. He always gave me this really weird, off-putting feeling in the pit of my stomach. It's like walking down a dark alley in the middle of the night while you know someone is behind you, Strangeland, Paparella, and Francis, 2019. With the evidence of the illegal adoption of Tiffany, John was charged with the murder of Lisa Stasi, although her remains were not found. In 2002, John was found guilty of three counts of murder in Kansas after one of the longest trials in state history. For the murders of Troughton and Luica, John received the death penalty in Kansas. Because the death penalty was outlawed in 1985, John was given a life sentence for the murder of Lisa Stasi. He still faced murder charges in Missouri, who aggressively seeks the death penalty. John wanted a plea deal, which the prosecutor wanted to be contingent upon John leading authorities to the bodies of Stasi, Godfrey, and Clampett. Although John admitted to the murders, he refused to lead authorities to the remains. Under pressure, the prosecutor eventually came to an agreement and allowed John Robinson to enter a plea for the murders of Godfrey, Clampett, Bonner, and Sheila and Debbie Faith. The plea was devoid of remorse and did not specifically take responsibility for the deaths but confirmed that there was enough evidence for John to be convicted in the deaths. John received five life sentences without any possibility of parole in Missouri in 2003. In 2005, John's wife divorced him after 41 years of marriage. 
John's convictions for Lisa Stasi and Suzette Trouton were vacated by the Kansas Supreme Court in 2015, based upon technicalities. However, the Supreme Court upheld his conviction for Isabella Luica and his death sentence for that crime. He remains on death row at the El Dorado Correctional Facility in Kansas. He continues to appeal his death sentence and conviction. Heather, who was only 16 when her identity was revealed, remained with her adoptive family. Her grandmother stated she did not want to take Heather out of a loving home she has been in since she was four months old. Heather did develop a relationship with her biological grandmother and was legally adopted by her adoptive parents after her 18th birthday. She remains committed to finding her biological mother's remains and putting her to rest.